So why do I say the Drought Tolerant Maze Project is representative of where the community needs to go? Well, first, it's about innovation. One of the biggest challenges facing a small farmer in Africa right now is climate change. They can't change the weather. They can't change where they live. But this project can help them thrive on their own land. The new drought-tolerant maize varieties will allow farmers to get 30% more maize yield in a drought. The second reason I believe this points the way is this project is directly targeted at small farmers. The theme of this conference is taking it to the farmer, which is apt. <clears throat> it is only by working closely with farmers that we can understand the problems that need solving and devise solutions that are likely to find traction. The Maze Project is structured to include small farmers like Sharifa Numbi, who was highlighted in the film in the breeding process. Drought-tolerant maize just doesn't happen in the lab. Technology can't help farmers unless farmers want to use it. And this is a lesson that we've been learning in agricultural development for well over 50 years. In Malawi, the government introduced various improved maize varieties for farmers to test out in their fields. Of these, the farmers preferred an early maturing drought-tolerant variety over others. In a year of severe drought, early, mature, early maturing drought-tolerant varieties offer added insurance against starvation. Malawi's Ministry of Agriculture took note, and last year the government endorsed the variety preferred by the farmers, encouraging thousands of farmers to use it in the country's most drought-prone areas. Now the third reason I think this, propture, uh, this project captures the direction our community is going is because it's based on massive partnership. Especially in tough economic times, we need to coordinate as never before to get the most out of our combined investments. And this effort to develop drought-tolerant maize is building on more than two decades of research and involves a broad coalition of partners. You saw that long list of partners flash across the screen after the film. Governments, NGOs, seed dealers. Each plays a vital role in making sure that quality maize seeds gets into the hands of small farmers. Partnership and coordination are an important way to get the value for the money we're spending. The new institutional model at CGR to help coordinate its research efforts is a great example of how we can stretch our resources by reforming, by modifying, by evolving the way we work. So I am inspired by the, the optimism of Sharifa Numbe. She said, through our hard work in the fields, we can eradicate poverty. She's right. Agriculture is the best lever we have to pull in the fight against hunger and poverty. We all agree on that. What's so exciting to me is that we're not staying in one place. Our community has the tools to help farmers grow more and more nutritious crops, even in the face of harsher we weather. Our community can keep getting better. We can learn more about small farmers. We can innovate to get ahead of the next challenge. We can form broader, deeper partnerships that allow us to maximize our impact against poverty and hunger. What's required of us is our unfailing commitment to the cause of agricultural development. It's the same commitment that drives Sharif, Sharif and Numbe and millions of other farmers in the developing world to wake up each morning and do their part to feed the world. Last night at dinner, I met eight farmers from Africa. One of them was Alice Kacharik. She's a widow. She's taking care of three children, and she's taking care of two children from her brother who has passed away. And I could see the pride and the excitement in her eyes as she said in 2005, on her one hectare, she was able to grow 20 bags of maize along with her soybeans and groundnuts. 
And last year, or last harvest, using the benefits of the improved inputs that have been made available to her, she is up to 150 bags in the last harvest. It was so uplifting to hear her story and to see that pride. She is a great example of the story in front of the numbers. I see that commitment alive in the eyes of everyone here today. The commitment of take it to the farmer. Progress against hunger and poverty is not only possible, it's happening. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. Jeff Franks uh, said he'd be willing to take uh, a couple of questions before we have to break to get down the stairs. Have our interns around with microphones. Does uh, anybody have any uh, any questions? Such an incredible presentation. <laughs> Chicago Council. Um, Jeff, I want to come back to the, the challenges we now face as a result of the economic crisis, recession, and, and the budgetary pressures. And those will continue, as you know well, uh, long into the future, uh, at least here in the United States. So what, what, how, do, how do we explain to members of Congress, to the American people, why, at such a time of economic distress at home, uh, the United States needs to make larger commitments uh, to agriculture in places far around the world? Is it just altruism? Is it economic benefit? Is it investing in success? There are a lot of narratives here, but we need to figure out how to make them, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could share your thinking about that. Yeah, a, a few quick thoughts. First of all, <clears throat> The bottom line is, it's about their interests and our interests. And I think the, the recognition of the importance of food security and economic development as a critical element of sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable progress in the developing world and the security that comes from that, I think is, is being recognized uh, by leadership in D.C. and hopefully other places. If you look very closely, and I was very fortunate to, to have a, a brief chat with Raj Shah when I was in Washington, D.C. on my last trip, and, and we didn't have a lot of time to focus in on the recent uh, uh, announcement of, the, of, of the, the collaboration, if you will, between the White House and the State Department on the direction of, of foreign policy. But one thing that, that Raj emphasized to me that I found quite heartening was the idea that people now really see that there's a distinction between um, stability and um, economic development and, and how that can be sustained. And of course, given sort of the military challenges, the defense challenges that are out there, I think the recognition of that distinction uh, is extremely important. Second thing that Ross said is, is that clearly then the administration, hopefully members of Congress, will put a lot more emphasis on the investments that can be made to, to spur economic development, which can then underlie uh, uh, you know, sustained progress for the future. But I just want to come back to one third point that I think is so important, is we have to get out there and tell the story. We've got to tell the story of the successes, and we've got to tell the story of the impact. The average American citizen thinks that one of the larger portions of the, the, the federal government budget that is, uh, I guess you'd say, dispensable is foreign aid. The average American citizen doesn't understand that less than 1% of, of the federal budget is in, you know, is in foreign aid or official development assistance. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that people understand 
just how important, how impactful the, the investments are that are made in smart assistance, smart aid, and then make sure then that if we tell that story, we have the public will that's necessary to support political will. So that would be my three thoughts that I, that I would add. Any one last question out here? Student. Yeah. Student, all right. This is always the toughest. Hi there, my name is Lauren Reed. I'm from Jessup, Iowa. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. People from Nebraska like people from Iowa. Awesome. <laughs> I was wondering, um, do you ever run into any problems with organic supporters condemning your work because it deals with genetically modified organisms, and how do you deal with those naysayers? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, was it Lauren? Yeah, Lauren asked if we deal with challenges from people who are anti-GMO, uh, if that uh, is a challenge or an impact in our work. And you know, I could probably sugarcoat the answer, but the truth is we do think that can be a, a challenge. Uh, when I meet with the, the lack of, of uh, let's see it, the... This <laughs> 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 is not a tough question. The question is whether you're going to get Jeff Rakes unplugged. I sit down with farmers in Africa, Malawi, or Zambia, or Kenya, and I see the challenges they face, and I recognize that the technology tools aren't the only answer, but they're an important part of providing the options that will give these farmers and their families the opportunity that David and Lucy uh, have, or the opportunity that Alice Pachera has, I just, I wish they'd sit down with me and look in their eyes and tell me that we should deny the use of that technology opportunity as part of giving these farmers choices. That's, that's how I see it. You may not see that in the standard answer on the Gates Foundation. <laughs> now, is safety important? Absolutely. And we have significant grants to, put, to help put in place the regulatory structure so that the results of all the different breeding, conventional and GMO, can be properly tested. Are the business issues important? Absolutely. Our approach at the Gates Foundation is to work with the private sector companies who are willing to contribute their resources, it may be intellectual property, it may be their expertise, contribute their resources into partnerships that will ensure that these smallholder farmers have access to the results of the, the, uh, the output, the new seeds or whatever new technology at affordable prices. In most cases, I see that these Agricultural interests are saying this is a way for them to contribute their expertise, their successes, to help others. And as part of our grant making process, we help to ensure that that, that that is the deal. Take, for example, the Drought Tolerant Maize Project. I think now there's 50, 50 African varieties that have been, have been aided by uh, technology from, from American agricultural. Uh, producers and there's no you know there's no income stream back or anything like that so there, there's a lot of misperception about about what's what's happening there so so you know I, I wanted to start out with what I think is most important which is let's give these smallholder farmers choices okay and let's work together to figure out what our a set of reasonable choices and let them make the choice. Don't deny them the opportunity to have the choice. But underlying that, you have to make sure you put in place the support for safety, you have to make sure you put in place 
on a business model so that those choices can be affordable. We are committed to that, and it is happening. Thank you. that uh, your, your comments in response to the last question really hit home with me. The first symposium I ever organized at the World Food Prize was about the role of biotechnology, GMOs, in feeding hungry people and brought people from Africa, India, and China here just to be able to make that point that you made so eloquently and one of the critical issues. So I, I know Dr. Borlaug and his heart felt the same way, and I'd like to give to you, to, and through you, to the Gates Foundation, one of his replicas, bronze, his Congressional Gold Medal, and also a copy of my biography of him, so that it'll always be a reminder, I know you have your own reminder of him, but of our gratitude to you and the Gates Foundation for all you do, and for you being here today with us. Thank you so very much. that provided